Jennifer, do you want to put some notes out there in front? Uh, um, as far as like what we're doing here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm having a little bit of a coughing fit at the moment. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> nothing serious. My dear friend and roommate is a wonderful chef. And she's yeah. cooking um, a dish right now with a lot of strong peppers. And it kind of got smoky in here, so we're both coughing a lot right now. So <laughs> I apologize for that. Oh, is that like a I'm tear also laughing. So, um, <laughs> excuse me. But yes, I will. It's just tear gas. Actually, it, you know what? David, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand it over to you to yeah, introduce. Fair enough. So we say we all, please. You know, that reminds me of a quick story. Um, <laughs> As I've done for like the last eight years doing these uh, uh, live storytelling events, um, I often share things about myself that I would never share in a job interview or um, to anyone um, that I wanted to impress anyway. And um, your coughing episodes reminds me, uh, I was in jail, however briefly, and um, I became a trustee. And as being a trustee, it's kind of cool because you got paid 50 cents a day, but they also um, like made you do things. And one of the things they did was they made us, um, me and this other kid, made us um, go into this room where they shot, uh, it wasn't quite tear gas, the pepper, you know, in the air guns with the, with the balls that explode. It's like a paint gun filled with tear gas. And uh, they made us clean the room filled fill with these, uh, Tear gas balls, and um, I made it. I made it through it. How unusual! Um, I really miss standing up in front of a room with a bunch of you guys, uh, making eye contact and feeling the room. This is one of the elements I'm missing right now. Is that outside of my cat sitting on my lap, I don't have any reference for uh, the energy that excites me so much to be around when I'm in a room full of people uh, waiting to tell a story. But that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, we're gonna tell a story. The theme is called uh, Sibling Rivalry and um, that's whatever that means to you, um, as always. There's not a lot of us in here. Who's hands up or, or beep your horn if you're gonna tell a story tonight? I'll throw out something my sister did to me, so. Well, you know what? I knew I could count on you, Savannah. You know, I was like, nobody's going anywhere until Savannah shows up. And she shows up a little pink, so I appreciate you coming forward. So the rules are what? The rules are five minutes. It's a true story um, in your own words and be as vulnerable as you want to be. Um, there will be no prize money tonight, not like usually. Um, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, Savannah, tell me a little bit by yourself, like what um, interests you in storytelling or your background in it? I, I know I've seen it before. Um, I don't know. I just started writing a couple of years ago. I'm not actually a very good public speaker because I speak too quickly when I talk. So um, I started going to Dime Stories in um, Point Loma. Um, in doing their three minute dime storytelling things about some true stories, some not true stories. And it was starting to help me for a little bit. And I did that for a couple of years, but um, yeah, I got introduced to So Say We All like uh, really early this year. And yeah, hopefully I can, I like to make people laugh, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's one of my most favorite things. Um, I don't really tell stories off the cuff though. I normally write them up and rewrite them many times right. for yeah everything's yeah. in the drafts constantly right yeah so. dime stories is such dime stories is such a great um outlet because i used to go quite a bit uh friday nights and uh it's so good because it marries you to a three minute story whatever you're writing i forget the form i think it's four words whatever it is fits right into the three minute slot and um yeah it's a great thing to get up stand up uh to tell your side of the story like yeah i met some great people there too yeah so were you able to attend any of our so say we all live shows like at the whistle stop some of the, the uh, bam yeah. shows at all or 
I went to the one in February. That was the first one that I went to. So, I mean, that was the best theme. So it got me interested and I went. <laughs> so, that was, uh, what was that called? Dirty, what was it? The, it was like the sex and drugs and like right. all that. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. I think that was, that was probably like the last show. Yeah, it was. It was the last show. Uh, um, that we did. At the Wizard Stuff. Right? Um, yeah. I don't know. If they, uh, yeah, that was the last show. That was um, Pills, Props, and Play Things. Dirty Talk. Okay. Yeah. Well, Savannah, um, feel free to be off the cuff however you want to do it. Um, whenever you want to get started, we'll start. Okay. Um, like I said, I'll just tell some funny stuff that happened between me and my sister. My sister is five years older than me. Um, very quiet, very polite, whereas I was loud and not so polite. And um, she was always jealous because I would get all the attention in the room whenever I would walk into it and everyone seemed to ignore her. So there was this underlying sense of tension throughout our whole entire relationship. Um, and she would torture me uh, on the side and no one would ever believe me because they would just think I was trying to get attention for some of the stuff that she did. Um, and one time, uh, one of the things that she did, we had Brussels sprouts for dinner and I absolutely hated Brussels sprouts because my mom didn't know how to cook them. She just boiled them. So they ended up becoming like these giant balls of green mush and just like didn't know seasoning because she was from the South and we only did like lard and salt. So um, yeah, did not know how to, boiled Brussels sprouts are the worst vegetable ever. So um, I had this giant serving of Brussels sprouts and so did my sister and we would sit at the table and eat by ourselves. Um, <laughs> and she, um, I finished all of mine cause I'm a good child and she did not finish hers. And we each had a glass of milk that we also had to finish because it was, you know, the nineties and you had to drink the milk for your bones or some nonsense like that. Really it was the hormones and everyone got huge tits after a while, but, um, so we had this milk that we had to drink and we um, couldn't leave the table unless we had drink, drank it. And my sister, my older sister, put her Brussels sprouts in my milk and then she had a clear plate and I couldn't get them out and I started complaining and she was like, well, no one's going to believe you now because, you know, you're the one with the milky Brussels sprouts and they're going to think that you put your Brussels sprouts in there. So she gets up and leaves the table and so I'm stuck here with a giant glass of milk and green Brussels sprouts and I'm really upset but I can't leave and so after about an hour goes by my mom comes downstairs to yell at me about why I hadn't like finished my um, milk and I was just like I, I really don't want to I don't want to eat it like I don't want to drink it and she was like um you still have to like you gotta do it you know uh, so I start drinking it and the balls of green mush start falling into my face and she sees what is hidden in this glass of milk and she starts getting on to me about, you know, wasting food and doing all the stuff. So we were super poor also. So, I mean, the fact we got any green vegetables whatsoever was kind of a, a luxury. So, uh, so she made me sit there and eat the milky Brussels sprouts uh, one by one. Uh, just like the gushiest, grossest, blandest nonsense in the world. And I had to eat those and my sister got away with it. And yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's probably second to her taping me up in a refrigerator box and then shoving me down a hill and have it roll down the hill. <laughs> but that was more fun. I kind of enjoyed that part. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. I'm more successful now though. So I feel like I ultimately won. <laughs> <laughs> where, where does your sister live? She lives in Georgia. She's a, a state park ranger. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Now she she carries a gun now, or is that is that how it works? <laughs> no, I. So she joined the Peace Corps, and I joined the Marine Corps, and so oh, okay. Thanksgiving dinners were very difficult. Right. Yeah. You know, um, I share a similar thing when it comes to my mother too always boiled the shit out of, out of everything. Oh. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I started to like green beans. I had no idea what they were. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, I love Brussels sprouts now. It's one of my most favorite 
Maybe it's one of my most favorite um, vegetables. So, but I don't boil them. Hey, no. don't turn around, but there's somebody behind you. Don't, I want to frighten you, but. <laughs> this is my kid. What if, you know what'd be funny right now? If you said, that's my kid, his name is Russell Sprouts. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that. That laughter was good. I can go to bed now. Feel good. Uh, <laughs> you finally found your audience, David. <laughs> I know. It took, it, took, it took a pandemic and an old rusty light bulb over here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Um, hey, I also want to encourage you. Um, uh, we have some other uh, more curated shows uh, via Zoom um, for, uh, for our VAM show. What's our next, uh, next theme and submission time? Our, um, well, technically the submission deadline has passed, but it's okay. We'll continue taking stories. Um, we are probably not going to do uh, VAMP this November, but we're still oh. going to, um, we're still taking submissions. We'll either take like whatever story you want to send us like we did um, back in March and April for mixed bag. Right. So we'll accept stories on whatever theme you want to send. Or otherwise, you can send us something for December, which is DNA. I always love December's themes. They open it up to so much, you know, for the holidays. So, yeah, start writing and sending stories now, everybody. We would love it. DNA is called? Well? It's called DNA, yeah. Okay. Justin's been trying to get me to write for So Say We All for a while, and I keep ignoring him, so... Um, yeah, yeah, you should definitely do it. Do it, do it for yourself, and then thank, thank him later. But definitely throw something in there, Savannah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for allowing me to share the lovely story of milk-flavored Brussels sprouts. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. Oh my gosh, I have similar um, stories yeah. like that. Growing up with a sister. <laughs> Good, good story. I also threw yeah, her through good. a closet wall nice. one time. Leave so, good. I mean, it Very definitely nice. evened out. <laughs> yeah, you don't have brothers and sisters until you've been to the ER. You know, I've been a few times. Right? You're here. Anyone here. else has been uh, beaten up before? AJ, right. I know you have, right? Absolutely. Right? <laughs> How could you not work with youth and not experience that, right? <laughs> How about you, Kevin? You got brothers and sisters? There we go. Um, yeah, I have a brother, so I could I could whine for a couple of minutes once everyone is done with their real, you know, good stories. Oh, okay. Let's get the good stories out of the way. Um, I didn't want Tracy, how are you? Tracy Star and oh, your voice sounds so weird. It's like you're talking through helium that nobody can hear. There it is. Yes? Hi. Oh, there you are. How are you doing, Tracy? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. My, uh, all of my things said it was, the show was at 11, and it's 1030 here. Well, welcome to California. That's how that works. Is it? Oh, it is 11 o'clock for you, isn't it? Well, I appreciate you. No, uh, it's it's 10 30 here it's uh oh, it, it, the time was listed wrong Press. okay it's it's part of the new agenda we're changing everything <laughs> okay well thanks for staying up late uh 10 30 or 11 that's great um kevin was just in the middle of telling us uh about his brother who lives in uh montana He's four years older than me. Um, but with us, you were talking about getting beaten up. With us, yeah. it was all psychological warfare. Like my whole family was very psychological and not physical. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, so, would, you, would you have rather the physical abuse or the mental abuse? Would well, I don't know. I just saw AJ laughing. And I don't usually laugh when I talk about my experiences with my brother. So maybe the physical might have been a little bit better. I think it is. Both. I think it is. I have a theory because <laughs> I have four brothers and just two parents, right? So they had five boys. 
And one thing they didn't do was ground us. Like, oh, you can't go out. They never did that. You would just take an ass kicking and be done with it. Because that was less work for them later, like to make sure you didn't leave or something. They just gave you an angry beating, you know, spontaneously. And it worked. I mean, I turned out great, right? <laughs> so I, I always appreciated that. Like, why would you punish yourself by uh, making your kids being their watcher, right? Um, any, any thoughts on that, Kelly Bowen? <laughs> Another mother of, of children at soccer practice? <laughs> yeah, they're out there on the field here. I turned a light on, so I'm not in the dark. Uh, Are they in the dark? Or, yeah. Thoughts on punishing kids? Well, yeah. I, you know, I only have one, so I don't, ha I don't have to watch sibling li rivalry that way. But my brother beat the crap out of me when we were kids. So I, 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 could, I could tell you about that if you want to hear that. <laughs> okay, tonight's He's, just uh, beating stories only. We're just like near-death experiences uh, via your sibling. It wasn't near-death. That, okay. that, that's far too dramatic for this story. No, he, uh, he's two and a half years older, and we're both adopted, so uh, he's 6'3", and yeah. I am 5'5", uh, I'm five five. so uh, he had a little bit of a height advantage, one could say. Um, he was pretty pissed off as a kid, as many, many kids are, punched lots of holes in walls and doors, and uh, me, well, not holes in me, um, <laughs> regularly would uh, find great opportunity to take out his aggression on me. I actually learned how to prop my bedroom door so that he couldn't open it, or at least I thought so. Maybe he gave up, happy to know that I was feeling like I was trapped in my room. Uh, actually scared the crap out of a couple of babysitters that way. Like we spent the night that the babysitter was there in my room with the door propped and all of that because uh, he was in such a rage and that went on for years just you know I, why my parents didn't do something like you know you shouldn't beat your sister up I, I don't know probably a normal story but when I was 10 I'd started hearing that guys and their genitals it's really sensitive and I was like ah, I don't and this one day he came after me and he walloped me on the top of my head. And I just, I'm like, well, let me try it. And I kicked him in the, just totally kicked him in the nuts. And he froze, burst into tears, of course, grabbed his crotch, ran away. He's like, ah! He never touched me again after that. That was horrible because, uh, what about him for all those years? But he never touched me again after that. Very nice. That's all you need to know, right? Uh, you know, that's how I learned for sure that, that kicking a boy in the, in the nads is uh, something that uh, actually works. <laughs> <laughs> and it still does. It's an old tradition. It still does. It's still being passed along generations. That's right. But I didn't have to teach my daughter this because I only have her. Okay. Um, who was that? Uh, AJ, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have uh, one sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> One's enough. Yeah, I would be okay. thrilled if yeah. I had any more. <laughs> I, um, I have, like I say, four brothers, five boys. And my dad... Um, my parents are from England and we all like were born overseas. So we grew up in Rochester, New York. And my father was like responsible for um, starting uh, youth soccer in the 70s. And he did that with um, a bunch of other dads who were like all like either Italian or German. Um, everyone like straight off the boat. There was never any youth <laughs> soccer in Western New York at this time. So, uh, the coaches, as opposed to like American Little League or Pop Warner, Fo Pop Warner football, the coaches are always like very encouraging and everybody gets to play and all that. Um, the coach 
coaches in the 70s, these uh, for you, like, they would tell you that you suck. They would just tell you, you know, in, in an accent, like, you play like shit. Your brother is much better. So I would go, like, seasons with, like, uniforms that never got dirty because you just never played, you know? And um, so, but my brothers were, like, really good. They were really good players. I just never got the bug to to become good at it. Um, so my brothers, I just remember like they were in like the, the local paper, like on the front page, like scoring goals, you know? And so the other parents would also tell you that you were terrible. Like you would hear them talking about you as you were playing as an eight year old. I would hear it saying, he's not so good. He plays like shit. His brothers are very good. I don't even know how they're related. Like, but like <laughs> relentlessly, eight-year-olds making you feel like a piece of shit. Um, th that's not the story I wanted to tell you tonight. I just segued into that. Um, I have another story I do want to tell. So I don't, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of that. But that taught me a lot. Um, number one, it taught me um, do the best that you can. And if you can't do it, um, your brother or sister could probably do it better than you. And learn from that. And you'll grow up and one day... Um, You'll get even. This is the part where I tell you about how uh, five German <laughs> guys went missing in the 70s, right? Anyway, <laughs> who's next? David, do you want me to, I actually did write down names today. Tracy, do you want me to, do you want me to pull names? Tracy, are you doing a story tonight? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, could you please? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Jennifer, tell me what you've done. Tell us what you've done. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I uh, wrote down names tonight. So uh, yeah, I have some names to pull out of the hat, the virtual hat. Guys, excuse me, I haven't been here in a couple months, not like that I'm all honed at this, but um, so that's how it works. She's written down these names, we're picking them off a hat and that's where we go. Um, <laughs> I know some of you have, have seen the show and participated in the show live in person. It's a totally different take. Um, so um, without further apologizing for me missing what I really miss, um, give us that first name. Second name. Third. Third name. Oh, look at this. It's Tracy. Oh, I, I knew it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Starr um, of New York City. Uh, he's You've been on this show a few times, and also mm -hmm. um, a big fan of uh, Eddie Van Halen. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Tracy Stern. Thank you. Uh, uh, rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. Um, so I, I remember when they got the painting, and I, I always hated that painting. Um, my father was always trying to get me involved in uh, family outings with his new wife and her three children. And if you met her, you wouldn't have known that she had three children because she wasn't warm and cuddly like a mom. She was icy and angular. And she always had a way of letting me know that I was kind of an unwelcome intruder in uh, the home that she shared with my father instead of the daughter of the person who paid the mortgage in the enormous mini mansion that she and her children lived in with him. I slept on a rollaway cot when I visited. Even when her kids were away visiting their father, I was still not allowed to sleep in any of the beds. Two of uh, her kids were older teenagers and they were very nice to me, but they were very rarely around because they had friends and lives of their own. And her youngest daughter, was Melissa, was five years older than me and they, were determined that we were going to be friends. We were going to spend time together. And Melissa spent most of her time tormenting me, including locking me in a closet when I was four, where I screamed until I was hoarse, but nobody heard me because the house was so big. And when Melissa finally let me out after about an hour, I went and I told on her. And my stepmother said, She's like your sister, and that's what sisters do to each other, which you don't know because you're an only child and your mother indulges you. And so nothing was done when she used to 
lock me in a closet or push me down or tease me till I cried because her mother thought that's how sisters should behave. And my father never stepped in because, I don't know, she had some sort of hold over him and he was convinced that we were going to be sisters. And so we went away one weekend to the Catskills because we were a Jewish family and that's the law. And in 1979, when a family went to the Catskills, adults hung out with other adults and they drank martinis and ate beef wellington or whatever it was that adults did. And the kids hung out with the kids and had the run of the resort. We could go in the pool or we could play in the game room or we could run around the grounds, but we certainly were not gonna hang out with the adults. And the older siblings didn't come with us. So it was me and Melissa and uh, my father and his stepmother's friends and their children who were all of Melissa's friends. And she did not absolutely want me hanging out with her. So she and her friends spent the weekend ditching me. So I spent the weekend running around the hotel trying to find them. And occasionally I'd see my father in the hotel and I'd go and tell him that I had nobody to play with. And he'd say, oh, go find Melissa. She'll play with you. And he'd stick some money in my hand and tell me, go play a game. And one of my revolutions through the lobby, I saw my stepmother sitting to have her portrait painted, which was such an odd thing for me. But throughout the afternoon, as I circled through the lobby numerous times trying to find my stepsister, my stepmother was continued to be in the lobby getting her picture painted. I even remember watching them put in highlights in her teeth and her eyes so it looked like they were glinting. And I remember thinking, she doesn't smile that brightly. <laughs> But the portrait was done and it was enormous and they took it home and they put a huge gold frame around it and they put it up high on the wall in the room with the vaulted ceilings over the baby grand piano. And even at that age, I remember thinking, who puts big paintings of themselves on their own walls? And <clears throat> as time went on, I remember bringing it up to my father that I didn't think that she liked me. My father said, of course, she loves you. You're like her daughter. And I told him that I didn't think Melissa liked me. He said, of course, Melissa loves you. You're like her sister. And it was like he was enchanted by them. And they continued to torment me. And I felt like that painting could see me from anywhere in the house. And I hated going there. And then one day when I was about seven, my father sat me down. And it was like he was breaking some kind of news to me, like, like something terrible had happened. He told me he and my stepmother were gonna be taking some time apart, but they were gonna work things out. And secretly, I was thrilled. And little by little, each time I visited, which started to become more frequent now, she wasn't there and Melissa wasn't there and more and more things of theirs were gone from the house. Until one day I went and my stepsister's whole bedroom was gone. But the painting remained. And I said to him one day, how come that painting is still here? And he looked at it and he kind of smiled. He said, what's the matter? Don't you like that painting? It reminds us of things, things we used to do together. And I said to him, no, I don't like that painting. I never liked that painting. I never liked her and I never liked Melissa. And I never liked any of the things we did together. And the next time I visited, the painting was gone. And so it seemed, was there a spell over him? Because he never brought them up again. That's my story. Very nice. Thank Thanks. you, Tracy. I'm, sorry. I'm a big fan of Tracy Stern. Thank you. So glad you, we, I met you through this. Um, you might be one of the best things that happened this, to me this year, Tracy. Oh, thank you so much. I love doing this right show. Thank you. You're right up there with this, the scooter I have. You're right up there. Right, you're like... <laughs> like neck and neck <laughs> no but tracy thanks um did you guys go to brown's universe uh, uh brown's in, in the catskills uh, you know what i don't remember the name of the i was only up there when i was a very small child when i was five and before and i don't remember where we went because then I, I i i never went there after that okay because this came up uh, recently we, we me and emily were talking we've been watching uh the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and they do a trip where they go to the Catskills. And I remember uh, having friends that did the same thing. You go to the Catskills for the summer retreat, right? Yeah. We only went, yeah, we used to go for weekends. We, my stepmother had a, had a bungalow somewhere upstate. I don't remember where that was either. And, uh, but it was somewhere up there too. And again, it was all Jewish families. 
and I don't remember where right. it was. And there's nobody alive that I talk to who knows where any of those things were. All of that <laughs> is gone. All of it is gone. Yeah, how strange, huh? Hey, whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to that portrait? I don't know because what. Once it was gone, it was gone, and nobody ever brought it up again. Uh, but um, and my my father is gone too, so yeah. I don't have anybody <laughs> ask any of those things right. to. What a weird! It's such a weird thing though. It was one of those gigantic ones that you would see in a library, like right. in a yeah, of those big like a royalty, right? Yeah. Like with hounds or dogs or horses, yeah. right? Yeah, it right. Was, which is a very like um waspy thing to do for a Jewish family, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. With a big gold frame around it is very strange. Yeah. Yeah, it's very self very self indulgent too, right? I um, can't even imagine what that would have caused because he painted it right there, like she sat for it right there the whole day. <laughs> right. Oh that's that's great. It sounds um, creepy. Right. <laughs> she was creepy. I'm I'm sure you would hang that in your house though if you had it today. Right? As soon as you walk in your house, it. even if it I takes up half your apartment, that's okay. Like, just, it's like, it's like I... I don't have a wall, like, I don't have a wall that would... Conversation yeah. piece. Very nice. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You doing any other shows in New York? I'm on a, a show called Fear Love that an organization called ACT puts on. It, uh, next Thursday the 12th. Okay and where can we see that? It's you know it's on Zoom. It'll be on Zoom. It'll be uh, it'll I'll be uh, promoting it on Facebook. Okay what's the keyword we're looking for? ECHT. E-C-H-T. ECHT. E I'm sorry one more time. ECHT. E-C-H-T. ECHT. And okay. the show is called Fear Love. Okay. Can you put it in the in the chat? Oh, sure. Is that an acronym for something, or is that like the worst name somewhere to come up with? And they're always like repeating <laughs> I think how to it's say an it. acronym for something. I don't know what it is, what it's for, though. Are I've you never saying been able to No, no, no. Ech. Oh, like etch. No. You're always writing it down. All right. Thank you, Tracy. I'll look, we'll look for that. Uh, Thank you. Your, uh, we'll look in your Facebook for it. Um, Thank you once again. Tracy Stern. Um, someone's got a list. Oh, I've names. got the, uh, the names. Ready for the next one? I'm, are you guys ready? That's the question. Okay. Oh, Kevin, you're moving your head. I wasn't sure if that was like a frozen picture of you. Okay, thank you. All right. AJ. Oh, joy. <laughs> I love, I love. Oh, who knew school. the man in the middle? Hollywood Squares. Doesn't this feel like how are you guys on a square here? You can be, you can be our Paul Lynn from Hollywood Squares. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, AJ, um, you've seen him before because a lot of you have been in this room before. And if you've been to a live event, you've met AJ before. Um, uh, one of my favorite people um, next to that scooter and Tracy is AJ Johnson. Uh, uh, he's been coming around for the last couple of years to a live events and I uh, love to see you even if it's just on Zoom, um, telling us a story. Also a past contributor to our last uh, Best of Show at the Versionary Theater for um, his first year in the, on the big stage. And I hope, I'm looking forward to seeing you again on a bigger stage again. Ladies and gentlemen, AJ Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, so when I saw sibling rivalry, so many different things came to mind. And so I'm, I was like, which story do I tell? And then I'm like, I'm going to try to cover them all um, because it started at birth. Um, <laughs> and my mom tells me a story of, of she had seven miscarriages and it's just me and my sister. My sister was kind of expected and, and she's two years older than me and she became like a princess. My mom had had a miscarriage, then my sister came along, and then my mom always says, you're a miracle. You were a miracle because in between you and your sister, you have some other, you know, siblings that were miscarriaged. You'll meet them in heaven, on and on and on. So this is a story that I know. So my sister was always a princess, 
And I think I came into her life at a point in time where she had been such a princess that I took so much attention away from her that she wanted to kill me. They, they could never leave me alone with my sister. Literally, she was trying to kill me. She would try to put a pillow over my face. She would try to throw me in the trash can. She would claw at my face. My sister could never be alone with me. And my mom would sit up there and say, if you weren't in my arms or if, you, or if she wasn't in the room, I knew she was trying to kill you. So this happened really early on. We couldn't have like teenage babysitters as we got older because they couldn't handle us. By the time I got a little bit older, we were fighting to the death, knives, everything else. And the neighbors would hear us, we would draw blood, we would just fight, fight, fight. But I can also remember at a certain point in time, there was a show on in the 70s called Wild Kingdom. And I can remember I was trying to piece this together and there was an episode where they were talking about birds. And there's this one bird that will lay its egg in another bird's nest. And when that bird hatches, the first thing it does is it kills the other birds from that nest. And I'm like, that's my sister. She's trying to kill me because I came along. There's also regular birds that will the first one that's hatched will actually push the eggs out of the nest. So as like an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old, I'm like, this is nature. My sister is trying to kill me because this is nature. I'm trying to piece this together. Now, mind you, my sister and I, we always fought. We still fought. I have scars. I've been to the emergency room. We've drawn blood. The doors, we've knocked down doors. Like, um, the Shining was nothing to us. I'm talking like <laughs> chopping through a door to kill someone. That was routine in our household. It was, it, was, it was life or death. But I can remember that there was been three times, my sister's still a bitch to this day, but I love her. There's been three times when we've been aligned. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say we were more in alignment than anything else. When my parents told us they were getting a divorce, they gave my sister and I an option. And we were about 11 or 12, and she was about 13 or 14. And they gave us an option of living together with my mom or my dad or, you know, rotating every six months or living separately where my sister would live with my mom for six months and I would be at my dad's for six months and then we would kind of switch back and forth and my sister and I never had to live together. But we chose together to live together. So I was like, okay, we're doing this together and there was no real thought about that, but we wanted to be together even though we wanted to kill each other. So that was one time. Still after that, we fought, like literally when we went to my mom's house and they were divorced, we probably fought that night and tried to kill each other. It was just a weekly thing. The neighbors knew, our friends knew, break them up because they're going to kill each other. So that was 12 or 13. The second time that I knew that my sister liked me or had an affinity for me was not until, um, probably not until I came out as gay but it wasn't, it wasn't a positive, I like him. It was, she liked me in terms of she cried and she was upset that I was gay every time that I saw her. So, because she thought I was gonna burn in hell and I wouldn't be able to go to heaven with her. And so I was kind of like, wow, she really likes me, doesn't want me to go to hell. That's very loving, that's good. But she likes me enough that she wants to spend eternity with me. She's hurt because she can't spend eternity with me. And she still hated me. She hated me even more now that I was gay. Probably wish that I was dead because I was gay. Um, Holy Roller Christian. But she wanted me in heaven was hurt because I was not going to be there. So my sister and I, we grew out of the fighting to kill each other. But we've always kind of hated each other. And she has kind of always been the princess. Still is to this day. The third time that I knew that my sister had an affinity for me 
and didn't want me dead, where we were kind of in alignment was, um, I don't know how long ago, but probably within the last 10 years, when the show Modern Family came out, I can remember going home for a Thanksgiving or some holiday, and I can remember my brother-in-law and my sister saying, oh, your show is on. We'd really like your show. And I was like, what show were they talking about? And they're like, you know, your show, that, that show, it's on. We've been watching it, and it's really good. And, and I'm like, I don't know what show you're talking about. You know the show with the gay guys on there, and they're normal, and they're just like regular and I had never watched Modern Family. I don't watch TV. I don't watch sitcoms, anything like that. So I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, we record it. So we go to the DV, DVR or whatever, and they play it for me. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is, this is a cool show. I need to find out about this show. But that day, my sister kind of switched her, I'm not going to see you in heaven. She actually watched the show and the show actually brought her to an understanding that gay people are normal, gay people aren't gonna burn in hell and that it's okay to be gay. And like there is this new modern family kind of um, approach to life and sexuality and everything else. And so that was the, the third time and the last time that she surprised me and let me know that I wanted to be around and that it was okay to be who I was, even though we still hate each other and she's a bitch, um, I'm gonna get to see her in heaven and we'll spend eternity together. So, sibling rivalry. And that's a mighty long time, right? Um, probably here. too long. <laughs> Very good, thanks AJ, really nice. Um, Who else is on that list, Jennifer? Who else is on that list? Everybody's already Emily, gone. are you telling a story tonight? No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I well, should. I have five sisters. Oh, yeah, you should. Well, for right now, then, that only leaves one name. That, that might be me. Kevin Burke. Kevin. No relation. That's right. <laughs> Although there might be some distant thing, I don't know. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, let's see. I didn't. I didn't come with anything prepared, but I got uh, Brussels sprouts and sibling subject matter. Um, we also had. Um, actually, I bet I, you know we have the same last name, Emily. But I bet Savannah and I are more likely distant cousins because my mom's mom was from Louisiana. And uh, my mother was also um, very astute at making um, Brussels sprouts taste as bad as possible. Um, but my parents, you know, raised both my brother and I, somehow he turned out kind of okay. And I, I was the one that had to go to therapy eventually. Um, but they sort of taught us like, don't complain. It's kind of like, have you guys, I, I guess you're muted, so you can't really answer, but I don't know if you guys have ever gotten like a, a parking ticket with the DMV, and if it's late, then the fees build up, and now you've got this parking ticket, and then if you screw that up, then it's like, it's this giant freaking thing. That was the way that my parents operated, was like, you complain a little bit, and well, now you've got twice as much Brussels sprouts, or now you're like, you know, you know gonna revisit the Brussels sprouts tomorrow night if you don't finish them. Everything just ballooned out, so... Uh, I at least learned very quickly, keep your mouth shut. Um, if you're uncomfortable or if you're miserable, um, there's nothing you can do or say that will make anyone care. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you say it that way, it sounds very, very unhealthy, but somehow, you know, when you don't think about it too much, that seems like a convenient way to parent. But anyway, I digress. We're supposed to be talking about siblings. Um, so, you know, growing up, it was, you know, difficult as with all the other stories that we're hearing, but it wasn't until I was like in my 30s or so that I started learning that there are people out there who have siblings and like their siblings and like do nice things for each other, either as kids or as adults. And I was like, really? Because 
So like the, the only time that my brother did anything nice for me, um, allegedly, was when we were the only two that were home. Um, I was probably like, I don't know, 10 or whatever, which would have made him 14, maybe a little bit older, I don't know. Um, and uh, we had this bunk bed um, in a fairly small room. I was uh, on the bottom bunk doing whatever. I probably had some, I don't know, GI Joe thing or something going on. And uh, I, uh, he was getting ready to do his 14 year old thing and like swing up to the top bunk instead of using the ladder. And I uh, leaned forward off the bed at just the wrong time and his knee went right there. Wow. Uh, just to, you know, on the eye socket there, nothing was broken, no hospitalization. <laughs> But as you may know, if you've ever been cut anywhere up here, blood is just gushing. Um, so it didn't even really hurt that much. So he drags me into the bathroom and starts, you know, bandaging things up. Um, and he was a Boy Scout. So, you know, three things you learn as a Boy Scout, as far as I could tell from him, knots, first aid, and how to bully other people. Um, so, you know, he starts doing the first aid thing. And, uh, but as I thought about it later, uh, I came to the realization that I think what he was doing was making it so that there wasn't a trail of blood all over the house that he would get yelled at for. Um, because that's the only thing in my 40 plus years on this earth that I can think back to and say, yeah, maybe he was doing something nice. I'm not really sure. Um, so, like, as far as I could tell, uh, I was, you know, the little junkyard dog that was just there for him to kick when he was having a bad day. Um, and I didn't really come to that realization until later, you know, when you're young, you just think, oh, my brother's mean, um, you know, mean, it's a, it's a small word, it's easy to understand. Um, but now I've, I've learned this new big word called dehumanization that I'm starting to sort of link to that. Um, so now I've, I've gone from, as a kid, hating my brother to being in my 20s and 30s and kind of forgiving him to being in my early 40s and going to therapy and now hating him again because now I'm like, how could you do this when there are all these normal people out there that actually respect their siblings, um, even, even if they're mean to each other? Um, so anyway, um, so I guess at the end of the day or at the end of the lifetime, somehow my brother the seeming psychopath who had no empathy at all for me or anyone else that i ever saw him around um he ended up getting like married at half the age i am now and having kids and moving off and having adventures with rvs and motorcycles and i'm the one who gets stuck having to pay for a goddamn therapist to undo all of the bullshit done in the first 15 years of my life um so anyway I didn't only really have a beginning, middle, and end, but that's kind of a meandering situation of uh, my sibling and I. That's a full story. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I think it's a brave thing to go into therapy. What What was it in your life that that you just said, "I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to go look in the phone book"? How did you How did you approach that? Two things. Um, one was, uh, my, uh, girlfriend from like three, I guess three years ago now, um, was, was like, she, she had gone through some, this is being streamed live on Facebook. So I won't guess I won't yeah. go into too, too many details, but it suffice it to say she, she had some, you know, experiences with depression, um, and some experiences with therapy. Um, and she was like, you should really like go to a therapist and like you know, help work through some of this. And I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, I guess maybe Sunday. But then like, I would talk about things every once in a while, like what was going on at work or what was going on in the video classes I was taking. And she would be like, oh, that's interesting that, that you would react that way. Cause didn't you tell me that like your dad raised you with this certain kind of aspect? And I was like, oh, you're right. That is a lot like the way my dad taught me how to deal with this situation. How interesting. And I was like, I think I would like to have that tool to be able to split the hairs and figure out why am I doing this? Am I really doing this because it benefits me or am I doing this just because that's what I'm used to? So those two things combined, I was like, okay, I'll give therapy a try. And now guess what I've figured out? And what I tell people is going to a therapist is like going to a doctor. 
you could go your entire life without going to a therapist and you'll probably be kind of okay. But there's like, you know, a 95% chance that if you go to a therapist, they can probably help you make things better, even if there's not like, you know, the psychological equivalent of a broken arm. Right. Yeah, there's, there's really something powerful in saying something out loud that's vulnerable to yourself that perhaps once you hear it out loud or, or say it to another person, that it loses some of the power that it's had over you for so long. And you don't realize that until you spill those words. And um, that's why I find uh, storytelling so compelling and, and so contagious to a lot of people because it allows you to be yourself. And we all wanna be funny, but sometimes it's not. And that's when it's really good for a story because it's your, your true story. Speaking of that, um, have we met Callie Linfer? She's like forever frozen. I don't know if you're catatonic like that all the time, Kelly. Here she comes. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Where are you coming from? I'm in San Diego. All right. What brought you here? Oh, I love so say we all. So no, I'm in San I Diego. No, I'm what? just kidding. No, I'm in San Diego. <laughs> oh, what? How did I come to San Diego? <laughs> he doesn't care. Nobody cares. Um, yeah. Nice to meet you, Kelly. Um, so you're, you've been to some shows uh, off, off the forest? Yeah. You've done some stories? Have you done uh, some stories with us? I haven't read from so. I've read from an offshoot, I think. Yeah. I, think I was in Far East when it first oh, came very out. very good. East County stories, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. That's did awesome, in, uh, Those are, did you grow up in El Cajon or Lakeside or? No, I grew up in Riverside and then la and then moved here for grad school so very nice yeah but i live in east county because that's where we can afford to live <laughs> so i wrote about that well seeing how you went to rad school I, everything must be great right <laughs> yes it's um do you have a story you want to share about sibling rivalries i didn't know that's what we were doing tonight <laughs> i was like uh i have six hmm. siblings wow uh, yeah <laughs> So that's interesting. Um, and they're put together in weird uh, connections. I always say that my parents deeply believed in marriage. That's why they kept doing it over and over and over again to other people. <laughs> so I'm my mom's only child and my dad adopted um, my brother from his second wife and then had three daughters with her, one of whom we lost and then they divorced. He got married. I got a set of siblings. They went away. And then he remarried the same year I married. And I got three more sisters. And that's how I ended up with six sisters and one brother. Um, so it's a lot of sibling dynamics there. But I was mainly with my mom most of my life. But the cultures between my houses were very different. My mom's parents, one's half Cherokee, one's half Blackfoot. And and then I come out of my mom like this, and then my dad's Mormon. So it was very matriarchy versus patriarchy. It was really good times um, growing up. And so going in between those two households was very interesting. Um, so my brother, who is my adopted brother, and I, uh, our relationship was okay. It's interesting, just sibling relations and how they change o over time. But um, my younger sister and I had a lot of sibling rivalry. I did not appreciate her arrival on the scene. Um, I really didn't appreciate that she was taller than me by the time she was five um, <laughs> at all. Um, and then I had a baby sister, uh, Sarah, um, who I probably shouldn't use our names because we're on a uh, streaming live. But anyway, she knows the story. So she was born when I was in a really bad time. And so she seemed like a miracle coming into my life in a way that an infant only can be. Um, and so, so uh, yeah, so that's my sisters. But relationships with sisters are, are very interesting. Um, so now, so we had, I don't know, in terms of rivalry, I'm not sure if we were rivals or more or less, uh, I don't know, figures in the same painting, I think would be more what we were, right? Like somehow captured in the same context, but born four and four and four years apart. So 
every all the contexts were shifting so we have a lot in common and then we don't because of our different circumstances so it's interesting when we get to retell our childhood to each other my sister i'll just tell one story um when i was nine i got uh absconded from my mother's house um because she was having mental health issues and uh taken to the farm where my father lived and uh, and there i was stuck and i was very angry about it and i made my dad go get my cat and my fish which was interesting priorities for about a nine-year-old anyway my sister has this one memory and she says you know i remember when we were you were that age and she would have been five i think you went crazy right that was her memory you went crazy and you were standing in front of the piano and i'm like yeah i remember that you were standing in front of the wink bench and you had I think, yes, you had punched me in the nose, and, right? Because we were very angry at each other um, for existing, yeah. And I finally decided that despite what would happen to me, that wasn't gonna happen anymore. So yeah, I went crazy. And that, that I think is the last time my sister and I physically fought. Um, from two perspectives. So that's about all. Completely unprepared to talk about any of that, but there you go. It's a little storytelling for you. Well, thanks for pitching in for us, Callie. <laughs> You're welcome. It's Callie, right? It is Callie. It's Califia. Okay. Thank you, Callie. Uh, Callie. Nice to meet you in Callie. person. I've seen your name around a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us, Callie. Um, uh, driving home from band practice, and I had this phone. Number. Sorry, I don't know if this is happening for anyone else, but it's David, you're really chopping up. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. I, um, the person calling was. How about that? Is that somehow better? Okay. How's that? I'll just keep right. the stream going. So I would call this number and because, um, again, Joey Ramon had given me his phone number after meeting him and after me pursuing my, um, someone who had got me through my adolescence and way beyond um, by him being a figure of uh, what cool was to me, despite being awkward uh, feeling and looking. So this guy was like a savior for me. So I would call this number from time to time and um, it was about 2004, maybe. Um, I called the number and I hung up as soon as somebody answered. And my phone rang back about a minute later and this guy said, hey, did you just call and hang up? And it was the way he was talking to me instead of just hanging up again, I, I said, you know, I was trying something new in my life at the time. I hope to continue to do this. And that was just being honest about what I was gonna say. So I honestly said, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I know who used to have this number, and um, I don't know why I'm calling it, but I call it from time to time, and I'm sorry, I won't, I won't call here again, okay? And he said, um, I'm, uh, I'm Joey's brother, Mickey, and um, I know enough about Joey Ramon, maybe all there is to know, who knows, but I know that he does have a, bro a brother named Mickey, and I said, you're Mickey Lee. He said, yeah, how did you know? I know because uh, Mickey Lee is his stage name. He was in a band called the Rattlers who never made it big, but he was still Joey Ramone's brother. So to me, he was always someone that knew Joey more than anybody else. And Joey's real name was, um, is, um, it's, uh, oh, it's like Mickey, uh, his last it's name Jeff. is Hyman. Just, what Jeff, is Jeff. Well, that's, that's Joey's real name, it's Jeffrey Hyman. So Mickey's, yeah. His brother is actually uh, Mickey Iman, oh. which is not a great stage name. Um, and so I explained to him who I was and I had met your brother years ago. And I imagine there's a long stream of people who have met Joey over the years that perhaps had the same story that I did, that he, he reached out to you and he was very personable and he made um, what I thought were idols like easy to talk to. And um, I had hung out with Joey a number of times and did an interview with him for a magazine. And um, we share the same birthday. 
And so this phone call to his brother turned into about 90 minutes and we just talked and his brother had just uh, published, was about to release his, he wrote a book about his brother called I Slept With Joey Ramone. Great book, if you want to borrow it, let me know. Um, and so he said, uh, do you play music? I said, yeah. He said, um, you know, my brother's birthday is coming up and I'm starting this thing called the Joey Ramone Birthday Bash. And it's something they do internationally. It's uh, bands cover uh, Ramone's albums. Um, in their birthday bash parties. It's, yeah, they're with a good friend of mine, uh, Russell Hicks, who does comedy today in the UK. And uh, uh, this guy, Dave Swain, who plays for the queers. Um, one night at the place called, uh, it was a zombie lounge. I think it's called the Soda Bar today. I think that's what it is now, the Ready Room, whatever it is. And um, this is all relative to sibling rivalry because uh, Joey and his brother had put a record together called Sibling Rivalry that has a lot of great cuts on it that um, I still play today. Um, it's the songs that I love to play along with on drums um, because uh, I think Joey was a really good writer. It was very simple stuff, but he's such a great writer. Um, it still inspires me. Um, so for me, that was like, um, realizing one day you, you can meet your idols and I've met other people, and, but I've never been as, as impressed as I was with Joey and the memories he left me because, um, again, he inspired me to, um, to be myself. So that's that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, um, I think that's the whole that's room, it. except for Jennifer. Did you want to tell us anything about your uh, childhood or anything you got coming up? I was talking about how I was a dumb one in my family. What's that? Oh, oh did you want to tell, do a story while we got a few minutes? Um, no, that's okay. I have lots of silly stories about my sister and me, um, but nothing that really feels like a, a good story <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, you. Um, so, you know what, actually I yeah. will, I'll tell one little Thank funny you. story because Thank it's uh, it kind of goes along with the season. Um, when I, when we were both little kids, um, we saw the movie Poltergeist probably way when we were way too little. Um, she's two years older than I am. Um, and I, I don't remember what year it came out or how old we were. I just remember that we were very young. And also at the time, or maybe it was just past it. I don't, I don't remember how um, this came about, but I don't know if any of you remember, there was a show, um, there was some children's show that had a character on it that was Bozo the Clown. Anybody remember Bozo? Yeah. And um, so she, my sister loved Bozo the Clown, but um, I didn't particularly have a thing for clowns. But once I saw Poltergeist, absolutely hated clowns. And I've hated clowns. I know that like sort of became a thing, but I've really, really hated clowns since, since Poltergeist. And um, so, I don't know if you remember, but there's a scene in Poltergeist where um, this kid has a clown doll and it goes missing. Mm -hmm. And then the, mm -hmm. he looks for it and the clown like reaches out from under his bed with his arms and drags the kid under the bed. And so my sister had a Bozo the Clown doll and she loved that doll and took it everywhere with her, like everywhere that she moved and everything. And so my sister and I ended up going to college together and living together and um, she managed to get me. She didn't do it every year, that's the thing. I would have expected it, but just like every few years around Halloween, she would get me and she would prank me with the Bozo the Clown doll. And she would either put Bozo in my bed under the covers <laughs> or under my bed with his arms poking out. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, uh, but then there was also a year when we were kids that um, 
we were running up the stairs and I was like trying to get in front of her and I pushed her down the stairs and she broke her toe. So I always consider ourselves even <laughs> for that. So that's my, that's my sibling rivalry story. <laughs> Oh, also, I will, um, since you mentioned, David, anything coming up, I yeah. will m make a plug for So Say We All's radio drama horror series called Listen With The Lights Off. I don't know if any of you have been listening, um, but if you haven't, please tune into that. Um, it's been going on as part of La Jolla Playhouse's 2020 Digital Without Walls series, and we are very, very proud of it. We have three episodes up right now, and we're going to continue to make a few more. Um, that is, you can find it either at lahoyaplayhouse.org, or you can find it on our website, so say we all online.com. And they're great, great stories. They've been professionally um, added to with uh, scoring, sound effects, and they've been performed by professional actors oh, and cool. they're all horror stories that were adapted from our anthologies our horror anthologies called black candies so good spooky stories for the season oh that's great and that's up you can catch that um where do you access that either at lahoyaplayhouse.org or so say we all online.com very nice cool and it's so awesome when uh someone takes something that happened to whether it's fiction or not, um, and adds dimensions to it with um, actors' voices, sound effects. Really, like, it's really an amazing feeling. Feel something that you wrote down on a piece of paper and have somebody reenacting it. Um, you'll hear things you never heard before. Um, it's being like, if you maybe you've read it before, maybe you spent hours writing it, but it's like you've never heard it before until it comes to life like that. That's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, we've had a pretty good response. I mean, a very good response from the authors um, that we've heard back from so far. They're loving it. They're very excited about the adaptations. So it's pretty cool. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, a scattering of stories, however unprocured. Uh, um, appreciate you uh, stick your hand up and um, saying I'd like to tell a story um, and continue to make more true stories because again, um, all your bad decisions are a terrible waste of time until you tell them to a bunch of strangers, either in a room or one of these camera things. So continue to do that, guys. Thanks for being yourself. Yes, thank you so much. And remember, the next long story short in December is all apologies. Okay. Yes, remember that, guys. Only Nirvana covers. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Love thank you. Bye. you. Thank Good you. Job. Thank you, guys. See you really soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.